Thank you very much. I was so impressed by this generous introduction that I lost track. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much for inviting me. In my professional life, I've been dealing with fiscal monetary problem, but first of all, with institutional systems. <clears throat> and I consider this to be most important by far. <clears throat> there are four basic questions for the empirical study of institutional system. First, and preliminary, to define the main dimensions of variables and to measure them. And there is quite a progress in 50 years' time because we have some empirical indices of institutional variables. <laughs> Second, the study of cohesion. In other words, to answer the question, what constellation of institutional arrangement can last? Cohesion. And which cannot last, and why. Third, and by far the most important empirically, this is the link between differences or changes in the institutional systems and various dimensions of the quality of life. Not only economic, even though they are extremely important. For example, economic growth cannot be explained without explaining institutions. But also the types and dimensions of inequalities depend on the systems which is largely neglected in this nonsensical debate on inequalities in the West. Or self-realization depends on institutional system or extent of fear very much depends on the type of the systems. <clears throat> and false dynamics, changes or lack of changes. Today I would focus on the four false problem with the best eye, but I have to mention some previous points without which one cannot study dynamics of institution systems. <clears throat> now, I will skip definitions, or will look at it very, very briefly. Perhaps this. One, uh, this is the second question of cohesion. <clears throat> For example, why a socialist in a classical sense is a monopoly of the state ownership can never be democratic in the classical sense. <laughs> so it's a contradiction in terms. I will come to that. Uh, then there is a lot of confusion between, uh, a big conceptual confusion as far regarding the delimitation of systems and policies. And in my presentation, which is available, I try to clear up uh, this uh, question. Let me only say that institutional system depend very much on, on differentiating in one crucial dimension, which is the concentration of political power. And heavy concentration of political power, can, which can exist when power is not divided, is extremely dangerous, also for the economic reasons, because it attracts psychopaths, and psychopaths have crazy ideas. <laughs> oh, and they are surrounded by cronies. So it is one of the misconceptions is to link the notion of crisis in a sense of a deep disruption in economic life with capitalism. But the deepest disruption was caused uh, present in the non-market systems, because of a heavy concentration of political power, Mao Zedong, and this deep disruption were often linked to genocide. And why we have such a mistaken idea that crisis occur under capitalism only? <laughs> because of the lack of comparative research. If you, if you don't compare, you draw wrong generalizations. So comparative research Broadly based is extremely, extremely important. <clears throat> and now systems depend, systems as defined among other things by the degree of concentration of power, they define a many of possible policies. And uh, even if policies under democracy happen to be very bad, they can never be so bad as policies under some non-democratic system. Because democracy, even very imperfect, sooner or later crowds out or eliminates very incompetent people, sooner or later, and psychopaths. Now, so if you change the system, 
you change the performance through two dimensions, opportunity set of individuals, in other words, freedom. So you move to more freedom, then you improve performance. I mean economic freedom, which is the most, negle most neglected freedom, especially among philosophers in the West. <laughs> if you read Rawls, it says hierarchy of freedoms, then economic freedom is relegated to the second. Oh, huge mistake. And then uh, uh, system differ in uh, the risk of very serious wrong, serious wrong policies, catastrophic policies. Okay. Now I am moving to dynamics. <clears throat> at first, at say more abstract level, and I will distinguish a decentralized system, which of course has to be a free market system or rule of law, etc with heavily centralized, which can be equated with socialist or communist, if you will. <clears throat> and they have different dynamics because of their nature. So if you start with socialists as defined by extremely heavy concentration of political power, then a naive question one should ask, why such systems which are very bad in both along economic and non-economic dimensions last? Why do they last? We know that they last <laughs> quite often. And the simple and naive simple response is because they are based on fear. And fear can be effective. It is systematic. Without fear, that's very bad economically, very systems would collapse. But also with bad system as characterized by heavy concentration of political power, the political elite is shielded from the bad consequences of the system. So they don't, do not feel it. While the majority of people are intimidated. And this is, ex naive, this is an explanation. And it's extremely difficult to predict when a bad system would collapse. Why? Because you would have to have an insight into the black box, which is the elite. And even the participants do not know when the bad system would collapse. For example, it was a huge but present surprise that the Soviet Union has collapsed. But it was nobody has foreseen. In the wildest dreams, it was not foreseen because it could not have been foreseen. It could have been guessed, but nobody even guessed that this extremely bad system has collapsed. One empirical puzzle is why, uh, after destructive rule of Mao Zedong in China, which cost uh, 70 million lives and produced very bad performance, the Chinese moved to market reforms in the late 70s, and de, de facto they abandoned socialism as defined by the monopoly of state ownership, while the Soviets continued with socialists in the 80s. And Gorbachev, who has had great service of contributing to this dissolving of this bad system against his will, I think, believed in socialism until the end. And he cannot respond by any theory. It has to be a very deep historical research. But Chinese, Chinese Socialists was transformed or abandoned while party which called himself at his colleague himself uh, the Ch communist party still rules over non socialist system. But the name is remains the same. <laughs> so just I am leaving this is an empirical puzzle, I'm not going into this puzzle. Now regarding Decentralized, decentralized systems defined by private property rights, lots of competition, lots of entry, rule of law, more or less. The naive question is this, and it's perhaps not so naive. We know from experience, and people who live under this system know that they, this system perform much better than centralized systems, okay, with opening. Why the better performance of this system does not guarantee their preservation? Because they are under attack. They are not 
violent attacks by erosion of freedom, especially economic freedom. And this is the political economy of uh, capitalism under liberal democracy, to which I will come in a minute. I would like to make some points on that. <clears throat> so one can say that different systems, widely different systems, has very different dynamics. A central system which is very bad can last, and then if it changes, then changes unexpectedly. A decentralized system is threatened by erosion, which does not come from outside. It comes from within. And what is the nature of this erosion? <laughs> this is, a, as I said, about the political economy of institutional change under liberal democracy. So this is just the summary. Now, at, at a less abstract level, it is useful, I think, to make typologies of uh, institutional systems which are based on the most important dimensions which can be measured. And I think there are at least four or five measurable dimensions which help to distinguish existing or potentially existing system. One is democracy. It is the best to de define democracy following Schumpeter more or less like uh, open co political competition expressed in regular elections. Now, this, and they, this should be separated conceptually from two other variables, which are pretty often collapsed into just one. Civil rights, like which take for granted, we take for granted freedom of speech, of association, etc., etc., they are indispensable for full-fledged democracy, but they can also serve various per different purposes, interest groups. Would not exist without extensive civil rights. Rule of law have hundreds definition, no point and no time in good to going. Let me only say this is now measurable. You can describe numbers and we more or less intuitively what, is the, what does it mean uh, there is a high level of the rule of law. Nobody is above the law. Uh, equality at least formally against the law. And policies, politicians rule through law in accordance with certain basic uh, assumptions and not through secret services. Which is, and then a uh, different definition, I skip it. I can come to that. Now, <clears throat> Democracy, high level of extent of civil rights, plus rule of law, together, I think, define what is usually called liberal or constitutional democracy. Now, we can say empirically, for sure, that without extensive civil rights, you cannot have democracy. Without a certain elementary level of the rule of law, we cannot have democracy. Because if you, as a ruler, if you can imprison your main opponent, how can you have competition? And it was done by Putin with respect to Navalov, etc., etc. So this is the set which we define as a democracy. But what is forgotten very often in social science is that the fourth condition to have liberal democracy, which is extensive economic freedom. Because it's impossible to have uh, democracy and plus other uh, features with monopoly or prominent role of a state ownership. Empirically speaking, it, it can be explained. I leave it for the discussion. Oh, the simplest reason is this. If you have a mon monopoly of state ownership, you can fire everybody. So it is a huge punishment and rewarding machine large state sector, especially dominant state, but there are some other reasons. Now, what is socialism in a classical sense, and as it was introduced in practice, the defining feature is deprivation of economic freedom. Monopoly of state ownership, no markets. Now, if you introduce it and want to maintain it, given bad performance, you have to intimidate people. Otherwise, it would collapse then if you want to integrate people, you can't have extensive civil rights. 
and you can't have rule of law. So the notion of democratic and not democracy is like vegetarian hyena. Does it make so much sense? So, and this is a very logical system. It's very consistent. But what is the most important institution, the most characteristic of socialism? KGB. Without KGB, there would be no socialism because there would be no intimidation. Now, uh, many people are surprised that most uh, Arab countries, or even more broadly, Islamic countries, are performing badly. They should not be surprised because most of them is quasi-socialism. Quasi-dominance of state ownership, most Arab countries, Iran is quasi-socialist, South Arabia is quasi-socialism because the majority of the state sector, if a majority of the state sector, economies are performing badly and you have to intimidate people. That's the simplest theory of socialism. Now, the practical discussion focuses on, on what is called capitalistic system, and I can only mention that they differ very much. What is the best is the most criticized by populist, academic populists in the West, which is free market capitalism which assumes rule of law. It is not uh, anarchy, rule of law. And uh, the closest which can, uh, is characterized by usually democratic, it's extensive civil rights, you can see the characterization. There are only few countries in the West which approximate this, and I have listed them, there are perhaps more. A bad kind of capitalism is a chronic capitalism, like Russia. Why? Because it's a very unequal protection of economic rights. So you, there's a privilege, there's a, there are politically privileged businessmen called oligarchs, which enjoy very high level of protection, is including the possibility of rob normal businessmen by using prosecutors and tax administration and blackmail. And obviously such a system is not only unfair, but cannot be efficient because there is no competition. That's it. <laughs> and most Western economies fall in a mixed bag, which I call overregulated and fiscally unstable for time time systems. Why there are, there are so many countries? Because of, of the attacks on economic freedom and fiscal discipline. So which comes, which brings me to the question what are the sources of attack on the best system? Empirically best system is under attack. And why? <clears throat> so very good relative performance is not enough to protect a good system. And, uh, okay. Now, under liberal democracy, I mean what is, what is called liberal democracy. Uh, certainly not Putin. And uh, there's a huge literature, by the way, on what has happened to economy, including especially economic freedom and fiscal stance under liberal democracy. And uh, on a very uh, abstract level, one can say, borrowing from physics, that this is the product of two opposing forces. One would maybe call liberal in a European sense which promote market reforms and defend, uh, and defend them, if achieved. And second are the opposing forces, which for some reasons are uh, acting in the opposite dimension. And one difference is this. Uh, look that uh, status groups, anti-liberal groups, are often motivated by commercial considerations. They can get money in the forms of rent seeking, privileges, etc., etc. But not only that. What is underestimated is a status role of ideological groups who are not motivated by money but motivated by a desire to save the planet by extreme ecologists. And this is under researched. But let me say that, say, people who defend economic freedom are usually not motivated by money. So there were weaker incentives. So they have to be better. 
because they are facing it. They, there's no, no prospect of pecuniary gain, which is in front of various pressure groups, commercial or pecuniary pressure groups. <clears throat> now, I think one cannot, in discussing the theory of the evolution of the economic systems of economy under liberal capitalism, cannot omit Mankur also. He was a great social scientist. I think without him, we would not have a good empirically based theory of interest groups, but he obviously had, did not say the last word, but he made an enormous contribution. This is the list of variables we should be considered in uh, trying to research various dynamics. I mean, they are obviously interlinked, but they are also chance factors. They are not only systematic. For example, if you have appearance of a gifted demagogue, it's like a shock. He <laughs> make, make quite quite a difference. To the to not not necessarily for the for the good. Now, so the study of the political economy, which is behind uh, the uh, economic systems and the liberal democracy, most largely the study of chance factors and uh, <clears throat> various interest groups. But there are also situational factors which I would like to discuss very quickly. This is about also. But adding to us, us commenting on him. <clears throat> As you might remember, he played, put a great emphasis on discrete events revolutions which uh, if, if you have a good, uh, a good direction then they get rid of pernicious interest groups, collectivist interest groups. But as I mentioned, <coughs> there's, other, there's a role of other factors, a huge role on the market system of technical change, which has institutional consequences. For example, you certainly know it, Internet-based platforms are changing uh, market economies in various ways, but also politics in various ways. <laughs> so we cannot omit this factor while researching institutional dynamics and uh, liberal democracy. I mentioned that one should focus more empirically on ideological uh, motivated interest groups who make, have very strong motivation as Fanatics from time usually have strong motivation. So extreme groups have strong motivation. Now, let me focus for a while on situational factors. Types of economic situation. How does it influence the balance of forces uh, between liberal and status groups. And my observations are purely empirical, just hypothesis. Now first, <clears throat> improving the economic situation is bad or dangerous for market reforms. Even if it is a result of previous successful market reforms. One naively one would think people should appreciate that they have a good economic situation, improved economic situation, because they have successful economic reforms. Look at Germany. <clears throat> Ten years ago, there were reforms done by social democrats. They contributed largely to the improvement of economic situation, especially on the uh, labor market. Is it enough to guarantee the persistence of these reforms? No. It's not enough. Why? Because they are interest groups and some politically motivated, ideologically motivated, commercially motivated. The conclusion is you have to fight. You should not situational factors very rarely guarantee a success of good things. This of course refers to rule of law too, maybe under attack. <clears throat> so even if economic, improving economic situation is uh, due to previous successful market reforms, and even if you can say, look, you have this better situation because we did these reforms, 
it is usually not sufficient. <coughs> because there are various interpretations and first of all various interests. And where is the strongest antipathy towards free market capitalism? Under capitalism. Absolutely. <laughs> and you can get a lot of money and fame if you publish anti capitalistic books. Pure nonsense. Noami Klein. Terrible nonsense. Pickett, I think, is a nonsense from the empirical point of view. But what, how he is called? New Marx. In Poland, still, it would be an invective. In the West, it is a compliment. Look at this difference. <laughs> Okay, so even if uh, market reforms bring economic improvement, it's not enough. But it's even more dangerous that if improvement comes from non-policy factors but windfall gains, then you can, cannot link improvement to, 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 to policy factors and uh, these windfall gains in various forms, low interest rates in the Eurozone, for Spain was a windfall gain. This is very dangerous. Windfall gains are very dangerous for the po economic policy, given the short-term sighted horizon of most politicians. It's a fact of life. Not all of them. So, summing up, economic improvement is a bad time for reforms. For preservation of conditions, it doesn't mean they're impossible, but more difficult, and you need a special combination of factors which are very good communicators as politicians and leaders in this form. Non -typical, you need non-typical politicians under these circumstances. What about the opposite situation? <clears throat> you have a crisis. The common view is that the crisis is bad, but at least has one positive effect. It forces reforms. And in many cases, it's been true, has been true, but not always. Not always. It's, one should not try to get the crisis, but if it happens, it may facilitate reforms. But the link is far from perfect because of this. Very much the impact of the crisis on politics and policies crucially depends on the prevailing interpretation of the root causes of the crisis. And the prevailing interpretation is a product on conflicting messages. So you have to fight for correct interpretation, otherwise populists would win. Now let me oppose two cases. In Poland, <clears throat> there was an economic disaster in 89, but there was a feeling of liberation from the Soviet dominance. And also people realized on the whole that economic situation is very bad, and they linked it to the bad system. So this was the prevailing interpretation and it facilitated acceptance of what some people would say harsh reforms, you know, freedom enhancing reforms, uh, because people were uh, more ready than normally to accept these reforms. I call it the period of extraordinary politics or window opportunity. But this is a gift of history. You cannot produce it. How long it can last? A year? One year and a half before normal politics of petty quarrels <laughs> emerges. And one of the arguments for very fast reforms and comprehensive reforms and was that. There was not only an argument, it also made economic sense to move fast away from a bad system. But this gift of history make it even more important. So this was period of extraordinary politics in Poland facilitated radical, radical reforms. I would contrast it, for example, with Argentina, where there was a series of crises which was mostly ascribed, they were mostly ascribed to previous ref market reforms. There were generally market reforms in Argentina, privatization, deregulation, etc., but these reforms were crucially incomplete. They left ticking bombs. 
like the mechanism of irres fiscal irresponsibi irresponsibilities will be at the level of provinces, rigid labor markets. Once external conditions worsened, crisis appeared, and most people blamed the crisis on market reforms. It's a very different situation because of historical factors. Now, a more general observation. <clears throat> In history, we have various combinations of personal factors and situational factors, and they are chance factors. We cannot plan. What is the worst combination? When bad guys have good luck. <laughs> this is the situation in Poland. I can discuss, if you like, in, in Orban. Etc. So because the good luck are windfall gains, bad guys are using it. <laughs> Many people think it is because good, good, good situation because of them. Another second best is Second bad is when good guys have good luck. When good guy, this is dangerous because good guys may be under pressure not to do something. But it's not as bad as so various combinations. There are four combinations. <coughs> now and last just to mention it, I introduced this notion of positive and negative linkages. And this is again objective factors, which however depends on history. By positive linkage, I mean a state of mind of population which links market reforms to something good, which are not market reforms. In Poland, in the Baltics, people knew that if, one, if they want to be liberated permanently, they have to support market reforms. And it can be tested. Oppose this to Russia. Many Russians, not all, linked what happened under the heading of reforms to the loss of empire. This was a negative linkage. It was not initially very strong, but what we had in Poland or in the Baltics, the feeling of extraordinary poly could not have existed so strongly in Russia. This is not justification, but just an observation. Nevertheless, and this is the last comment on reforms on the liberal democracy or on the trans in transition economies, there is a personal factor which is in interaction with situational factors and sometimes a very good personality may prevail over not very favorable situational factors, I would say Gaidar in Russia. He was wrongly blamed, by the way. He was such a personality in his group. On the other hand, good situational factors may be wasted. If you have somebody in charge who does not understand what to do, who does not have the proper perception of risks, is afraid of moving forward instead of being afraid of staying put. <laughs> and so in personality factors matter in conjunction with uh, situation factors. And finally, last point which is <coughs> it's referring not to the situation before the war when most democratic countries became dictators, except for former Czechoslovakia, by the way. <laughs> but I have in mind our recent events where under genuinely free elections, well, you have bad transitions, and I, the, this, uh, I define bad transition by lowering the e level of rule of law, reducing civil rights, and in consequence, reducing the extent of democracy as a competition. So what we are dealing with? Now, some of these bad transitions have been completed. This is Russia under Putin. Belarusia and Lukashenko. Uh, By completed, I mean that under this regime, opposition cannot win. You know who is going to win. By the way, when I read in the Western media, in other media, the following phrase, phrase Putin has won elections. Everywhere. Putin has won elections. There were no elections, <laughs> but only pseudo elections. And how could you win pseudo elections? But everywhere, this is, I would say, false objectivity. 
to call the same name, with, to, to, to use the same name with a very different situation. This is one of the traps, by the way, of the language, of pseudo-objectivity. <laughs> okay, now we have, there is, a, uh, there is an ongoing discussion whether the transition was completed in Hungary. And even before recent elections, Kornai, a very prominent social scientist, was saying that uh, opposition cannot win elections under Orban regime. Now, in Poland, we have a bad transition which, which started, is not completed, and we have to stop it. And I think we can. It's not impossible. I am coming to that. And finally, what would be interesting for political scientists is to see where bad transition were started and were democratically reversed under democracy. Where? I have in mind two examples. One is Macedonia. You have to, and another one is Sri Lanka, where there are two strong brothers dominate Poland. But perhaps, perhaps there are some more. Very interesting case. Now, many people confused in their observation on that transition to very different points. First, what caused the beginning of that transition? In other words, what bad guys have won elections? And second, what happened next? There's too much tendency to look for easy generalization and, and to group Trump, Kaczynski, Orban, Erdogan, etc. That's cheap. Because behind every case, you have different combination of factors. And there may have some superficial commonalities, like, for example, that many people are using Facebook. It's not enough to explain. So one has to be very, very concrete. And for example, in Poland, the present ruling party, mockingly called law and justice, <laughs> oh, uh, they did not need to win elections, but they are extremely lucky. This is the case of bad guys having good luck. For example, they won presidential elections, even though the previous president, a very nice guy, <clears throat> and decent one, have 70% popularity ratings at the beginning. And his opponent has three. Uh, the previous president has awful, very ineffective election campaign. But his contestant was very, much better. Perhaps he used Cambridge Analytica or something of this sort. And good guy has lost. Once bad guy has started to occupy the president's office, this helped to win next elections. In and also, one of the, the most important check was eliminated because the new president who still rules, his name is Duda, he's a marionette of the party leader. So they are, uh, and he, a different person would have used, could have used veto power and stopped that legislation. And just an example, and there are some other chance factors. But the second one is more important. What happens? after uh, that transition starts. <coughs> and let me offer you a very, my very short theory, <laughs> which is based on empirical observations. I think any, any group which wants to perpetuate itself in political power has three instruments to use. The first one <coughs> is bribing or clientelism, buying votes, buying support. It is done through two channels. The first one is money from the budget. The second one is uh, distributing jobs. And the larger the state sector, the most jobs to distribute and to punish the opponents. Second one is uh, indoctrination, which is a very polite word and trying to use threats through the media, demolishing the image of the opponents. And the third one, and this is the ultimate weapon, if it is captured, is intimidation through state institutions. Every authoritarian ruler tries to capture the state because the state is the most powerful organization in terms of repression. And the party hacks are not enough. 
and one has to measure the prospects of further bad transition but by what has happened to each of these three instruments. And I offer you my observation in Poland. First, clientelism, they cannot bribe anymore because what was, could be done has been done. The budget has a deficit and if very good economic situation in European Union stops and the problems which are masked because of the situation would emerge. Everything which could be distributed in terms of jobs was already done. Un unbelievable distribution of jobs. What remains? Tools of intimidation, which are not used massively to be sure, I'm not saying, but the legislation to use these institutions has been introduced against the Polish constitution. And it is the task of civil society to monitor what respective functionaries of police or prosecution, etc., are doing to make it public and to increase the risk among these people and on the other hand to protect person who would be subject of uh, potential intimidation and this is absolutely the most important in the situation when other tools have been already exhausted. Now finally, bad combination as I said is when does it improve windfall gains and bad, bad guys. <laughs> By the way, it was how Putin perpetuated it himself in power. He assumed power and he was initially generally popular because Russia was at the bottom and it could only get better. It got better. He was very popular and under the guise of popularity and good economic situation, he gradually captured the state. And when his situa economic situation got worse, he perpetuated himself in power because he mastered the third, the most important weapon for autocrats, which is intimidation. So the, the lesson is that one has to stop captures, the capturing of the tools of in intimidation, which is, of course, the role for the groups of civil society, defenders of freedom. And the last observation is this, that the, these example, the recent examples of bad transitions are bad from the political point of view, values like rule of law, civil rights, but they are also bad from economic point of view. So none of these authoritarians is enhancing economic freedom. Neither Putin, no Orban, not, uh, not Erdogan, not Lukashenko, and not the new rulers in Poland. So sooner or later, economy would get worse, but it takes time. One should not waste time. One should look what is happening to the instruments of intimidation and try to stop it. Thank you very much. <clears throat>